Honorable Member for Castries South East, Minister for Economic Development, Housing, Urban Renewal, Transport, and Civil Aviation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I stand, I rise to give my support to this appropriation bill presented by the Honorable Prime Minister on a vision plan for this country for the next four years, divided into phases of each budget cycle. Madam Speaker, permit me the opportunity to say thanks to the Almighty God for such an opportunity as this, to serve this country in one of the highest capacities to the people of St. Lucia, and especially the people of Castries Southeast. Madam Speaker, this debate is turning out to be an extraordinary debate from what we have seen in the recent past. This Honorable House, Madam Speaker, in looking at this appropriation bill, have raised many questions. But Madam Speaker, I have never seen a debate with so much back and forth in terms of people wanting to make a presentation to this honorable house. Madam Speaker, on this side of the house, we can speak and we will speak. Because, Madam Speaker, it appears to me that the members opposite are afraid. Yes. They don't want to speak, Madam Speaker. Yes. I assume that after I have spoken, all of them will be eager to speak, Madam Speaker. Yes. So I await to see the outcome. But I will deal, Madam Speaker, with some of the issues that have been raised by those who went before me. And where necessary, Madam Speaker, I will respond appropriately. You know, Madam Speaker, we have come to this very critical juncture in the history of the politics of this country. Madam Speaker, I believe it is a critical point because of what we have seen that have transpired in this honorable house. Madam Speaker, some of the debate goes to a very low level. You know, Madam Speaker, I want to speak to some of the issues that have been raised here. But Madam Speaker, I do not attack people. I attack situations. And when a situation arises, I will deal with it accordingly. Persons may be injured in the, pro in the process. But the intention is not to attack the persons, but to deal with the situation. Madam Speaker, every prime minister who has served this country has been labeled in one way or the other. And the members opposite, Madam Speaker, have been famous for that. Sir John was called Jabla. George Odlum, the late George Odlum, was called the Great Satan. The Honorable Stevenson King was never acknowledged by members, some members on the then opposition as Prime Minister of St. Lucia. To the point, Madam Speaker, we're at an independent celebration, Madam Speaker. 
The then leader of the opposition was called to speak. And protocol had not been established, but he acknowledged the governor general and said, I will adopt the protocol that has been established, rather than address the then prime minister as prime minister. And it's on record, Madam Speaker. The tapes are there to show. Today, they want to praise Sir John. The same Sir John they didn't invite to the opening of the Millennium Highway, which he had commissioned. But Madam Speaker, you think that's all? Dr. Von Lewis. And Madam Speaker, you need to read some of the extracts from the book Rainbow's Edge. And see what is written inside there. And he was labeled... Today, today, they are trying to label the Prime Minister again because that is what the Labour Party is good at doing, calling people names. They have called me all kinds of names, Madam Speaker. You're the man Satima. They call me Poodle. They say I'm uneducated. They say I can read and write. You name it, Madam Speaker. But you see, that is what people reduce themselves. Bad workmen always blame their tools. So they always find something. So the member for Ancillary Canneries, they pick on his size and his height. Madam Speaker, what place does that have in this honorable house? What place does that have to, to be calling people these kinds of names? Now, I don't have a problem with being called names, you know, because I can call names too, Madam Speaker. So, I'm not lamenting the fact that this is what it is. But no Prime Minister has been labeled as having a dual personality. Other than the Calypso which said about Kenny and Tony. So, Madam Speaker, all the names they may call people, but there's still one person. But when you see you have to deal with two people in one person, you have problems, Madam Speaker. Because you never know who you're dealing with. You never know. You never know. But, Madam Speaker, to preface what I'm going to say, I want to use a quotation from the book, Lapses and Infelicities, by the author, Rick Wynn. <laughs> Pick up the document house, make a document house, please. If not, you can quote from it. Yeah. Madam Speaker, I am quoting from page 282. And I quote, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it says, of course. And I'm quoting, Madam Speaker. Point of order, is that it? Madam Speaker, sign order 34. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 34A, Madam Speaker. Honorable now Member, you... get it before you call it. Thank you, Madam. But, but Madam Speaker. Of course, yes. I remain unimpressed. Okay. You are standing on a point of order. Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Madam Speaker, 44A, and I'm signing 44A, Madam Speaker, and then the sign order that I want to relate to is... This one? There is a point of order under 34A by rising, yes, 
So the point. Yes, man. Speaker. The, the, you direct the tension, yes. Madam Speaker, the member is quoting from a document, and I'd like him to at least make a copy of, of, of the page he's quoting from, at least the page. Because yesterday, last night, you ruled that. I have ruled on, the, on such a matter. Yes. So, I have ruled on such a matter. Um, Let's get copies of the page from which the Honorable Member wants to read. Honorable Member, could you give the page to, to the Sergeant at Arms that he may get copies made? In the meantime, if you can, proceed and you will get back to it when it is. Now, Madam Speaker, I just want to make an observation, and I hope, I hope I am permitted to make that observation. I've, you heard, are, you I've heard many people quoting. And I've heard many quotes. So when they will use the lyrics of songs, they will bring the album inside here. And when they will quote any of the writers that they are going to make a statement, then they will bring it in here. Because I brought the book. I didn't say, and I'm, I'm making a quote, Madam Speaker. A quote is specific that you can be held accountable if you misquote what you are saying is a quote. That's why you say end of quote. So, Madam Speaker, the cheap game being played on the other side. That's okay. It will come. That's right. It will come. But, Honorable Member, equally, um, with all due respect, um, members can cite references and, and stuff. So, for example, the point about songs and stuff is, does not stand because you can make reference a parser to a song or a verse of a song without having to table it. Um, what I ruled on yesterday was that if we're going to um, cite, cite and read from documents, um, other members must have copies of. And that is one thing I will stand by. And the thread is there in terms of I want to be ruling equally and impartially on that matter. So, so it does not. Honorable member, I am sure you can adequately proceed until the, the copies get here. I can more than adequately proceed. Please Madam proceed. Speaker. Thank you. Madam Speaker, not very long ago, the honorable member for Viewfort South said, I don't cry easily. Said it in this house, Madam Speaker. And that was a loaded statement in my understanding, Madam Speaker. Because when you look at what has happened to this country, I can well understand why the leader of this country has not been one who cries easily. I can understand that. Because when you see what people have to go through, especially the people in the area that he represents, the south of the island. I can well understand. But I saw him cry once, Madam Speaker. When he won the elections again in 2011, he cried. And I wonder whether he cried because he said, Gavin Buhot Abuizan. But Madam Speaker, as I go along, we will begin to understand that we need leaders in this country with feelings. We need leaders in this country who has a heart and a compassion for the people of this country. And there's nobody in this country, Madam Speaker, who would go through and see the situation that exists in certain areas and their heart would not be touched, and the tears would not come out at times. 
But some people don't cry easily. Others cry too much. But the others who cry too much, they cry for the wrong things. They cry for the position of power that they used to have here, not for the sake of the people that they represent. And that's the problem. That's the problem with some politicians. Madam Speaker, I heard a big cry about victimization. And I'm going to deal with that because that seemed to have been the subject for the member for Castries East. But you see, somebody quoted it yesterday. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Because Leoni Labitil Cafe Mumbai, Avonabai, who quesse Saufe, or Cape Epu. Say, but. But they translate loud the capali. Because my soup ali ni angle ni patwa because my copan soup the capal angle me soup the capali patwa. So we might need a translator for you when you speak in this honorable house. Because you don't even know what you are saying. Madam Speaker, moving on. Ojo Labs, the member for Castries South spoke about, you know, training people to work on the Ojo Labs and how that is an unfair advantage that you're giving an investor. So what do you think? You think the investor is bringing people from America or Mexico or Japan to work in St. Lucia? The people who would be paid, the people who would be trained are young St. Lucians. And if it does not amount to anything, they got a job for the period of time and they were paid. But you see. Madam Speaker, on a point of order, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this member for Cash Service is misleading the House. Madam Speaker, this morning, I did not say training of persons is wrong and inappropriate. In fact, in response to the member from Sufre, actually said, I support training. I believe there should be training. What I objected to was using money from NAPS, money that is borrowed, provided in the bonds, to pay the salaries of persons working in a call center, to pay $1,000 a month for 100 employees for 18 months. Madam Speaker, that's what I had a difficulty with. Now, Madam Speaker, one cannot say that if somebody is running a call center, he's employing people, and you're paying them, but you're going to call it stipend, as an apprenticeship or an internship. If somebody is working for 18 months in an enterprise, that's not an, a, that's not an apprenticeship, Madam Speaker. That's employment. But Madam Speaker, the member is misleading the House. I did not say that I do not support training or I do not want training. In fact, I'm making it clear I do. But I am opposed to using loan money under NAPS to pay the salaries of persons. Madam Speaker, please, as the honorable member, do not mislead the House. Um, and um, I want to bring that point. So, Honorable Member, what you seek to clarify there was you were elucidating, and you just stood on a point of order without saying what it is you, you well, you said misleading the House. And that was an elucidation, if I may, if I may say. And remember, we need to, when we stand on a point of order, we need to say what it is first, because that was a, 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 an incident where a member need not yield if he so desires. And you quite rightly applied it earlier on today. So members, just be mindful. I am saying it again. Otherwise, I will ask members not to yield at all unless you can state what point of order you're standing on and you must have it ready, not looking for it after you've disturbed a member standing on his or her feet. Please proceed, honorable member. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, what they are not saying about the Ojo Labs arrangement is that the government is paying a contribution. Because there are two things you can do, Madam Speaker. You can pay to train the people and then send them to work, or you can get them on the job training. And on the job training, 
would mean that the government would contribute some of the funds to the people, but the investor himself will be paying a percentage of the salaries of these people. So it's not like we're sending people there and all of a sudden, all of these people will be paid by the government while they're working for a private, invest, a, a private investor. But Madam Speaker, they know what they're talking about. They know because the people they sent and work under some of the nice programs for their political friends was paid in full by nice. So they think we're doing the same thing. And I think you said it earlier. You will, you will have time to judge this budget. And you will have time to judge Ojo Labs and come back to this honorable house and make a determination on whether it was a sound decision or whether it was a bad decision. Now, Madam Speaker, we are talking about 45% youth employment, unemployment. 45%, Madam Speaker. The last government ran a campaign on jobs. Jobs, jobs. Now, Madam Speaker, note, they ask them, what's priority number one? Jobs. Priority number two? Jobs. Priority number three, jobs. So they had one priority, jobs. Ask them how they did. Ask them, Madam Speaker, if they're satisfied that they filled out one, they gave themselves one job to create jobs. One job. Everything they did in government, one thing they gave themselves to do. Number one was jobs, number two was jobs, number three. So in essence, they had one job to create jobs, and they failed. And you want to come in this honorable house and lecture a government who understands how to run the affairs of the country about what to do and how to do it. And you know, Madam Speaker, the member spoke about World Cup this morning. But I want to remind him, I served on the transport committee of the World Cup team. So I knew I was an insider to what was going on. And Madam Speaker, you had to be there to hear some of the discussions. They brought some big time consultant down here to advise us on what to do for World Cup. And that was the first time I formally met the present Prime Minister and member for Mikud South, Honorable Alan Shasta. We ended up serving on the same committee. And Madam Speaker, when the members of the consulting team heard the presentation made by the Honorable Alan Shasta, then Alan Shasta, you know what the consultant said to me? He said, but why do you all have us here? We are accustomed to handling events with 500,000 spectators. Your, the capacity of your venue is 19,000. That's the number of officials we handle at a major event in the US, in Canada, and in these places. So, we did not even understand why they needed us here because after listening to the honorable member, we understood that he knew everything that was going on. That was said to me at the meeting. And, and, that, and I must tell you, that was my first very positive impression in meeting Alan Chastney and understanding that this is an individual who understands what he is into and he takes time to understand the business that he is in. I cannot say the same for those I see on the other side. When somebody who's supposed to be, is it a tax consultant or an accountant or something says that VAT was reduced by two and a half percent, Madam Speaker. 
which amounted to about $52 million. And in the same presentation, Madam Speaker, he said that the dollar fifty on fuel will bring up about $18 million a year. And then later on in his presentation, he said all what we gave in VAT has been consumed in the $1.50, which amounts to $18 million. So in his calculation, $52 million is equal to $18 million. I don't know what your profession is, but if that is how you do maths, I have a problem. Because to tell me that these two things are equivalent. Now, we're not talking about US dollars and EC dollars. We're talking about EC dollars in both instances. So I would love to hear the member for Castries is tell me how 18 million is equivalent to 52 million. But you know, Madam Speaker, I've always said that the members on this side don't know the value of money. If you do not understand the value of money, you cannot know how to use it. So whether you give them a million dollars or you give them a billion dollars, they end up the same way St. Lucia is in there. Madam Speaker, so I want them to understand, Madam Speaker, that looking at the situation that we are faced with, It is something that we need to understand. We have to work in the interest of the young people of St. Lucia. Madam Speaker, I am not comfortable with the number of young people who come to me for jobs. The former Prime Minister, by his own admission, indicated that there is a mismatch between the skills or their jobs available in St. Lucia that our people do not have the requisite skills for. And I think he gave the percentage at the time, but I don't want to misquote him and say I misspoke like him. So I would rather not quote the exact figures that he gave. But to say, Madam Speaker, that every time something is done for the benefit of the young people of this country, this Labour Party try to find ways to shoot it down. Every single program that is for the advancement and the training and the uplifting of the young people, Madam Speaker, is handled that way. But there is a reason for this, Madam Speaker. Now, did they lose my page? What number you said? 282. Okay. I think that's it here. 282. Madam Speaker, and I'm quoting. Of course, now that's under the topic, a doctor in the house. From the book, Lapses and Infelicities, a doctor in the house. It says, of course, I remain unimpressed by Kenny Anthony. His academic qualifications notwithstanding, I knew all I needed to know about him, and it wasn't good. In my book, he was just another diploma waving selfish perpetrator of all that is counterproductive to Caribbean politics with the character of a scorpion. Not my words. Not my words. Oh yes, these are harsh words. And they are true. End of quote, huh, Madam Speaker. These are harsh words. But the book says that in the opinion of the writer, it is true. And the truth usually hurts. Now, Madam Speaker, there is the story of the scorpion and the frog. And you know, the scorpion cannot swim, but the frog can swim. 
So they went into that arrangement. The scorpion wanted to cross the river. The frog said, if I take you across the river, you will sting me and I will die. Scorpion said, but how could I do that? If you die, I will die too. If you die, I will die too. So I will not sting you. So they agreed. Got on the frog's back, halfway across the river. The scorpion sting the frog. The frog died, drowned, the scorpion drowned. But while the frog, when the frog got stung, the frog asked, why did you do that? Now both of us go into that. The scorpion said, that's my nature. That's my nature. So, so Madam Speaker, here is a man who has been prime minister of this country for 15 years and every time something is going to be done in this country that may take us not it's not a guarantee that has a semblance of taking us out of the dirt that we are in he finds every way to criticize it and to fight against it and i will cite examples madam speaker when uwp was in government previously what did he say I will write to investors not to come and invest in this country because there's a corrupt government. Madam Speaker, you think that was all he would have done? You think that's all he would have done? Madam Speaker, look at what the Labour Party has done with the very CIP program that they introduced, Madam Speaker. When I came to this Honorable House and I said, bring the legislation, the guiding, the, the regulations to govern the CIP, they said, no, pass the law. We will bring the regulations after. Did you bring the regulations after? Did we ever get a chance to have a say? You see, you must never, when you're in office, Madam Speaker, you must never pass laws that you cannot live by when you're not in power anymore. And what have they done? So because CIP is likely to create some investment in this country, what has the Labour Party done? What have they done, Madam Speaker? They have gone out and publicly stated that we are going to revoke the citizenship given to people. Since then, they have modified the statement to say if it is illegal or, or if they, they, they got it through illegal means. But when they came out in the first instance, that is what they said. So they want to scare away investors. But you'll hear them shouting, we love St. Lucia. They love St. Lucia. They love themselves, Madam Speaker. They don't love the people of this country. And I can tell you, when we were in opposition, I saw, I saw a lot of things that happened with developments that was questionable. But you know what? I never blame investors, and I never attack investors for coming in this country and do things. It is the government who has to protect the investment. And so, Madam Speaker, it is easy for them to come and behave as if they care about St. Lucia and they love St. Lucia. It's not about St. Lucia. Madam Speaker, I watched the debate of the National Trust. And if these Labour Party operatives, but they have it. They capitalize on everything, Madam Speaker, to be in office. And you know what happened? I recall listening to a program with Jugwa when the late Rupert Gajada and Pat Joseph was on that program. And they were discussing what happened with the Banana Salvation Committee, a coupe, pa coupe. 
And Pat is still alive today, and he said on the program that the Labour Party was using them to get into office, and they were using the Labour Party to get what they wanted. So they destroyed the banana industry in the process. Destroying banana farmers' farms, burning sheds, doing all kinds of things to gain political office. Now, there are places we have to draw the line, Madam Speaker. There are places we have to draw the line. You know the places we have to draw the line, Madam Speaker? Church and state. And I heard the member for Castries, he said, oh, they're at war with the church. We at war with the church? Have you heard one of us said one word about the church? The members on this side of the house treats the church as a sacred institution. The same cannot be said for y'all because it's in Hansa. What y'all had to say about the church when y'all did not agree with the member next to me, the member for Central Castries, for her position on a moral issue. But today, conveniently, that's the first government in trouble with the church. We are not in trouble with the church. But I will tell you something. We are never going to use the church to make political mileage. And if the church calls a demonstration, as politicians, we will not be in the forefront. We may be somewhere in the back, not in the front. If the National Trust has an issue, when we want political things, we call for political activities as a party. Oh, CSA? Who was matching with CSA? Look him over there. Who was matching with the teachers? Who was matching with the teachers? So, so, yes, give them their money. You see, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, now I don't know, I've heard so many people quote scriptures. I don't know if I can quote the scripture, Madam Speaker, or if they want me to go and print it for them. But I would love to give each of you all a Bible. I would love to give each of you a Bible. Madam Speaker, in Matthew... 18 and verse 15. It says, Moreover, if your brother sin against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he has you, you have gained your brother. Verse 16. But if he will not hear you, take one or two more that by the mouth of two or three Witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen or a tax collector. Why did I read this, Madam Speaker? That is the approach that this government has taken to deal with the matter. We could have been out there. Mm -hmm. We could have been broadcasting. We could have said all of the things that we do not believe was fair and just. But no. We are dealing with a sacred institution which plays a very important role in the morality of this country. And for a few cheap political points, or to gain a few votes, I am not going to bring the church into disrepute in a debate like this. So I take my licks on what was said about St. Jude. I take my licks on everything that was said. I have expressed in the appropriate forum what needed to be said. And I know my colleague, the member for Grosile who chaired the meeting, the prime minister who has been dealing with the matter, 
you have not heard us. Because this is not politics. You see, you will use any and everything you get at your disposal to get into political office again. To get into governance. But that's not what this country is about. And you know, Madam Speaker, wrong information, misguided information, partial information. That is what they thrive on, Madam Speaker. Not the truth, not the whole truth, some of the truth. But you know, if you know your Bible well, if you know your Bible well, you would understand that when the serpent, when the serpent tempted Eve in the garden, almost all what he said was true. But it was mixed with a little error. So he said, if you eat, did God say you should not eat the fruit? But God knows that if you eat the fruit, you will become wise like him, knowing good and evil. Now that was true. If you had the fruit, you know good and evil. But that was mixed with an error. And he said to Eve, you will not surely die. That was where they were caught. So the members on this side of the house, Madam Speaker, they come, they pull out a document on the internet. They don't know where it comes from. And they tell you that's an authentic document. And that is what is in there. That's a work in progress. How can there be a, a document that's the final document on the internet? Anybody can write anything. Anybody can put it anywhere. You will judge us by what we put out. And we're not like you all. We pass a law that if when you win an election in the next 25 or 30 years, we did something wrong, you can still hold us accountable. The same could not be said about you. Because by time we had to deal with some of the atrocities that you committed. And I will tell you, the church has its view about you. But I will not disclose it. You know why? Because I respect private and confidential discussions. But I was well informed and well guided. So, Madam Speaker, in coming to the key issues, you know, Madam Speaker, there is something very interesting. Oh, I wanted to talk about diminishing returns and the jazz festival. And I know you understand that. But you know what? You deliberately choose to give part of the information to try and mislead the people of St. Lucia into believing that here is such a great jazz festival that is bringing so much returns to St. Lucia and all of a sudden, Flambeau come in and they cut off the jazz festival. You get, how many tickets you gave complimentary the last time around? Madam Speaker, they may have given as much as nine thousand complimentary tickets in 2016. Those with badges over 2,000 and those with wristbands over 6,000. 17,000 tickets. Free. Complimentary. The whole jazz was complimentary. You got it right, member for view for. Member for view for so, you got that one right. The whole of jazz was complimentary. But you see, Madam Speaker, we need to understand that these are tough economic times. And the government must watch how it is going to spend the few dollars that are available and make a determination on how best to utilize it. And so, Madam Speaker, if we decide to scale down the jazz festival, everyone said, oh, they stop jazz. They stop jazz, jazz going on. The Prime Minister did not say he was stopping jazz. The Prime Minister highlighted what would be happening 
that it would not be the premier event would not be just the jazz festival but the summer festival you know madam speaker but you know what i found very interesting about this debate the economic and social review of 2016 madam speaker has not been referenced by the members opposite and I found that very strange. Because I cannot understand how this book was the first document circulated. We went through the whole estimates of expenditure. I didn't hear anybody talk about that. So I was wondering, why? Is there something inside there that the opposition don't want to tell us? But I'll come to that, Madam Speaker. You know, why are we introducing the policies that we are introducing? I was questioned previously on the method of the debate and why I didn't have anything to say now that we are in government. Madam Speaker is there, the Prime Minister is there, and they know I consulted both of them on the matter. The member for Beaufort North had asked me that question previously. And I said, why are we going through two debates? Why you want me to debate numbers without the policy? So I have not changed my position. This is not my doing. I found it written there, and I am guided. But if I had my way, I present everything, and then we have a debate. But there were the members who, who brought it in, you know. When I was in government previously, there was one debate. Then they ended up, when they came back into office, they wanted more time, so they gave two debates. I have been so informed that this is the right method based on the standing orders, the constitution and everything, so I abide by it. So it's not my doing that I am debating the numbers and then debating the policies. I have the same concerns that I had previously. But you see, I am at the advantage and you at the disadvantage because I help set the policies so I know what the numbers are for. You are where I was a few years ago. A few months ago, you are where I so, So I want you to understand, I am being consistent in what I'm dealing with. So, Madam Speaker, how did we get into the mess that we are? And I tell you, they have some doctors that when you put them in charge of things and they give you the wrong prescription, after they give you the wrong prescription, they give it, they gave it to a pharmacist who is not trained to mix the medication. So there's a, the member for Castries is think he's leader of the opposition. He's sitting in the chair, but he's not the leader of the opposition. Yes, I never see second being first. But you see, jobs, jobs, jobs was first, second, and third. So I could well understand in their equation, Madam Speaker, why it's that way. But, but let's, get to, let's get to how we got to where we are. Madam Speaker. I will quote from a document again that is already a document of the House, so I don't think it is necessary for me to make it, a, it's not necessary for me to make it a document of the House. But it's budget speech of 2013. Honorable Member, I wish to inform you that you have 15 more minutes within which to complete your presentation. Honorable Member for Babano and Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries, Fiscal Planning, Natural Resources and Cooperatives. Madam Speaker, I would like to invoke standing order for the 210 to give the member another one hour, 60 minutes. Honorable members, the question is, 
that Standing Order 3210 be invoked in order to allow the Honorable Member for Castry Southeast an additional one hour within which to complete his presentation. I now put the question. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Honorable member, you are now due to finish at 7.45. Speaker, please proceed. Madam Speaker, I'm reading from page 9 of the 2013 budget speech. A paragraph under the heading, Our Challenges, High Debt, and Low Growth. And it says, if we continue in our current path, without making the necessary fiscal adjustment, then by 2015, the debt to GDP ratio will soar to 90%. Under this scenario, we would be degrading from rather than converging towards our prudential target of a debt to GDP ratio of 60%, and moving closer to 100% debt to GDP ratio, the path is clearly not sustainable. With such limited fiscal space, another external shock or natural disaster would then present significant challenges to this country. That's budget speech of 2013. Therefore, it is necessary to implement measures which would be at minimum stable, at minimum suitable. No, let me read again. Therefore, it is necessary to implement measures which would at minimum stabilize the fiscal position in the short term with the medium term objective of significant improvement. We must summon the courage to take the measures now rather than delay them only to suffer the catastrophic consequences. That's the budget speech of 2013. Madam Speaker, budget speech 2014, page 12. You see, Madam Speaker, when we write certain things, or when we write things, it doesn't go away. It remains. The fourth challenge on page 12, it says the fourth challenge is one of fiscal deficit and high debt levels faced by the government. In effect, the operations of government are not sustainable in the long run. Without adjustments, these operations are characterized by high levels of borrowing. Government is spending much more than it earns in revenue. As a consequence, the debt burden of the government moves upward, and more and more government revenue going towards debt payments. Now, Madam Speaker, these are truthful statements. But if you read every budget speech, you will see the same thing. You know, Digicel said talk is cheap. Well, talk is cheap. They know how to talk, Madam Speaker. And that's why they talk so much. But you see, there's a difference between talking and working. And I remember Sir John, the late Sir John, describing the UWP and the Labour Party. And he said, the United Worker, the Labour Party is like a yard fowl. It goes and it lays one egg. It lays one egg and you hear clack, 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 clack everywhere. Noise. A whole set of noise. The turtle the UWP is like the turtle on the other hand. The turtle comes on the shore, lays hundreds of eggs, covers it, and goes back on its way. Madam Speaker, 
all these people on this side of the house do is talk. No, I was given a description. Yes. If, if you want to be a yard fowl, then be a yard fowl. <laughs> so, Madam Speaker, I prefer to be a fowl than a snake. You see, Madam Speaker, here's the situation, Madam Speaker. The members on the opposite knew what the problems were. Now, knowing the problem is one thing. Being able to fix the problem is where we depart. They cannot solve the problem. They did not know what to do to put the economy on the right path. And they had one person who was giving them some good advice. The person they claim who fired the city council workers, Dr. Ubaldas Raymond, was giving them some advice. But you know, you know, rather than who was president of America at the time, when he became a doctor. I ask you who was president of America when he became a doctor? Bush. Bush. They had two bushes, you know, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, you know, the members of the Labour Party do not understand the problem of this country. They talk. They can talk. They can tell you things. But they have not taken one measure. What did they do? Increase water by 66%. Increase the storage of fuel. And I heard the member, I heard the member for Castries East yesterday misleading this honorable house to make them believe that the increase of the service charge of the um, consumption tax on the fuel having an impact on the price of electricity, knowing very well that the price, the fuel purchase for electricity does not come under that same mechanism. How can, how can a responsible member of this house, so-called leader of the opposition, somebody pulling his strings, Madam Speaker, because somebody has to be pulling the strings for him to say this. Right. How can you say that the price of electricity will increase as a result of the increase of the price of fuel at the pumps, when you know that is not true? When you know the fuel for the electricity has nothing to do with the fuel at the pumps. Trying to score cheap political points. We are not like the Labour Party. The Labour Party said they were not putting VAT on water. And then they went and increased water by 66%. It's better you had put VAT on water. It would have been 15%. Now we would have reduced it to 12.5%. Madam Speaker, they made a big cry during that time. What is going to happen? Zero rated items. What's going to happen? The basket of zero rated items will be removed. How many items have you heard in this budget presentation that the price of VAT is going to increase on them? But you won't hear a word about that. You know, I will tell you, when fuel gets to $15.85, you will talk to me. Until it gets there, we cannot talk. That's right, that's right. So I want you to understand, we are not telling the people that we don't know where the money is going. You see, the difference is, Madam Speaker, between this side and this side over there. The 680 was there, but they were saying they didn't know. So nobody knows where the money went to. It disappeared. On this side of the house, we tell you it's going up to $4, and we tell you that $1.50 is put into a mechanism to get our roads fixed. 
And if we come to this honorable house and we cannot account for the amount of money that we collected and show the corresponding road fix for that, then hold us accountable. But until then, you cannot talk here. Wait your turn. Next year, around this time, you will have the opportunity to criticize it if it doesn't work. But Madam Speaker, going to the point that is at hand, Madam Speaker, in the social and economic review, there are some very interesting things. But before I go there, Madam Speaker, they like Facebook, they like the internet, they go in and download information from the internet, and they come in and present it in this honorable house. Madam Speaker, on Facebook, CIA World Bank Facebook, during the reign of the last government, St. Lucia found itself number five in the worst performing economies in the world. Together with places like Ukraine, Venezuela, Libya, St. Lucia, Russia. Madam, Madam Speaker, these were some of the worst performing economies, and St. Lucia found itself there under the leadership of the St. Lucia Labor Party. Now, when you have three consecutive quarters of negative growth, you say the economy is in recession. We had three years, Madam Speaker, of negative growth. So I have not found a word for three years of negative growth. So is it depression? Is it suppression? I would think that the people of this country was so suppressed by the previous labor administration that the economy just could not grow. But Madam Speaker, the doctor ordered something to deal with the rising debt to GDP. What did the doctor order? Madam Speaker, no one chose to speak about the debt to GDP ratio in St. Lucia because something very interesting happened. We have gone to a rebase number. And all of a sudden, the debt to GDP moved from 80% to 66%. Now, how did that happen, Madam Speaker? The Statistics Department went out, and Madam Speaker, I will say some things here. I would rather be right than to be politically correct. And I will repeat that. I would rather be right than to be politically correct. Because some people want to be politically correct. And in being politically correct, they are wrong. Because what they are trying to do is to preserve a few votes and try to fool a few people. So, Madam Speaker, what happened to us in St. Lucia? There was a revision of the gross domestic product between the period of 2006 and 2016. Now remember, when Labor Party was in office, they brought down somebody to be the PS in the Ministry of Finance. Some guru they call him. They like to call people guru, so I use in that term. They brought down some guru to guide them on what to do. And when they realized that rather than the debt to GDP going down, it was going up. So they adopted a new policy to determine the GDP of this country. And here's what happened. The value of current prices increased by over $300 million. 
between 2006 and 2015. This translates, Madam Speaker, to an average annual change in current prices from 3.4 to 4.4%. In an average annual change of real GDP growth from 0.3% to 1.4%. Now, Madam Speaker, all these are play of numbers. You know why I see this as a play of numbers? Now, I usually question. And remember when I came to this honorable house, I said, Madam Speaker, I do not always trust everything I am given. And under the Stevenson King-led administration, when in 2011 we said that the economy had grown by about 4.4 percent, when they said the then leader of the, of, of the opposition, the members of the Labour Party said, that's impossible, that never happened. The, the economy was in recession. How did it grow? Well, Madam Speaker, if you go on these rebase numbers, it would show that in 2011, the economy grew by over 3.4% under the UWP administration. Now, Madam Speaker, the people who play these roles, you see, in, and, and I'm saying this and I'm being cautious, People cannot mislead a country for 10 years into believing this is what it is. And then all of a sudden, one morning they wake up and they tell you, well, I was wrong for the last 10 years. We were using the wrong method of calculation. So here's the right method. And it cost us the elections too. It cost us the elections. Because if people had understood, because what did they think? We were misleading the country. But somebody was giving the numbers. The member did not dream of the, mem of the numbers. But you see, Madam Speaker, this is what happens. And I can tell you, I am watching and I am paying attention. Because presently, according to the Social and Economic Review, Madam Speaker, we cannot compare ourselves to any of the other members of the ECCU. Because this new method has been released only in St. Lucia. And what you would think, Madam Speaker, is that at least there would be the corresponding numbers of the old system so that we could have compared the new rebase numbers with the old system. So you think the so-called leader of the opposition didn't know that? Why he didn't touch the debt to GDP? So, Madam Speaker... They stayed in office for four and a half years. Could do nothing to grow the economy. The debt to GDP by the admission of the then Prime Minister in his budget speech of 2013 said, if we continue on the same path, debt to GDP would be about 90%. It had reached 80%, so we have a rebase number that all of a sudden puts us back to 66%. Now, 66% should be a happy position for us to be in. Madam Speaker, they expected to win the elections. And they knew that if they had continued on the same path they were going, and they had won the election, then we would have to have a structural adjustment program. So, you can do And they went ahead to try and deal with the situation. Now, Madam Speaker, it is a situation of both the statistics department, and what they were commissioned to do. And Madam Speaker, I know there were several discussions asking, should these numbers be released? Where does it put us in relation to the other ECCU members? But you know, Madam Speaker, some professionals tell us that we cannot tell them what to do. So if we cannot tell them what to do, if these are the numbers they give, then these are the numbers we have to work with. But Madam Speaker, in reality, what has happened to us? Because they have changed the numbers and said that the GDP has grown by $300 million, 
the difference, Madam Speaker, and the real numbers are now, Madam Speaker, St. Lucia has not collected any more money. So the debt, the, the situation, the financial situation in the country remains the same. So we don't have more money for health. We don't have more money for education. We don't collect more money from the custom. That is what the problem is, Madam Speaker. For that matter, what we have seen, Madam Speaker, is if we had continued with the old system, our debt to GDP would have been around 80% plus. So what we have now, Madam Speaker, is a false sense of security because we have no more money. We still have to pay $165 million in interest payments. So, Madam Speaker, how does that help our situation? It may look good. It would make us believe, and that's what they were trying to do, Madam Speaker. It would make us believe that we have money or we have latitude to borrow. But I can tell you, we have a prime minister who understands you cannot spend what you not earn. Now, I know they will come and tell you, oh, but you have a deficit. We have said by the third year, we expect that we can balance our budget. You cannot sing the country into so much debt and think that we can come in one year and wave a magic wand and fix all the problems that it took you 15 years to create. Madam Speaker, this government, the honorable members on this side understands the situation in the economy. For that, Madam Speaker, for that matter, Madam Speaker, our situation is, however, the debt dynamics have worsened. So even though we are saying that the debt to GDP ratio has moved from 80 to 66%, our debt servicing has moved from 26% to 28% in 2015. So no pantli laja, Madam Speaker. That's just a make-believe situation. Now, if you know me and how I run business, you would understand, and my colleagues can tell you that. I never bought a vehicle that couldn't pay for itself <laughs> because I buy no vehicle and I have to go and work and pay for the vehicle as if the vehicle is my master. <laughs> I have to make the vehicle work to pay for itself. So, Madam Speaker, we have a situation in this country where the debt situation is unsustainable. And we continue to spend money as if there's no tomorrow. So when the prime minister said, the prime minister didn't say we're closing down the fisheries corporation. He didn't say we're closing down this, we close. We said we are reviewing everything. Everything is on the table to be reviewed. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, when we do what we have to do, and the, the then Prime Minister in 2013, he highlighted the problems. And if you go back to his budget speech of 1998, you will see he highlighted all of the corporations in his budget speech that we have highlighted. But you see, the difference is he could not make the decision. Because it became more politically expedient to do so than to do the right thing for this country. So it was about preserving votes while sinking the economy of this country. And that is why we are saying we have to fix this situation that exists in this country. Madam Speaker, what did we inherit? And I need to speak about housing for a little while, Madam Speaker. Because we want St. Lucians to own houses. But Madam Speaker, when you look at what we inherited, the member for Sufre touched on it briefly. There was a project started under the United Workers Party in the River Dore area. 
housing project. Alan Bush. Madam Speaker, 58 acres of land. The roads had been put in. The pipes were in place. Everything was moving smooth with the project. The government changed. The new government, and they talk about victimization. They talk, they victimize projects far less for people. You know, Madam Speaker, they stopped the project, refused to pay the contractor. Madam Speaker, and, and by way of passing, the Babono Council, there is a check that was written to a gentleman who did some work in the region of thirty-eight or $39,000. He still has the check in his possession. After how many years? Since 2011. He has that check, and uh, they stop the payments. They stop everything. And this gentleman who did the work up to a day like today, Madam Speaker, has not been paid. But I have given the assurance to the member for Babono that this United Workers Party will see to it that the people who work get their payment for the work that they did. Because you cannot have people work. And Madam Speaker, when I came into government in 2011, there was a gentleman who did a drain somewhere in Mondido. He did not have a contract. In, in 2006, when we won the election, he did not have a contract. I went and he came to me and he said, I was given a job. They didn't give me a contract. They tell me, go and do the drain, so I go and do the drain. The engineers at the ministry told me, yes, the drain was done, but he don't have no contract, they cannot pay him. I said, no man is mad in this country. For him to go and build a drain for government, we found somebody directing him to do it. They tell me, oh, it's not properly done. I said, let him fix it and pay the gentleman because the gentleman deserves to be paid because some politician who wanted to gain some votes on the verge of election Send the gentleman and do a job hoping to have won the election. And I say it for the CDP projects. We have paid almost 90% of the people. And whatever is outstanding, when we get the balance of the money, we are going to pay everybody. We are not like the Labor Party. And every contractor who did work can hold me accountable for that statement. Once we assess the work and the work has been done, Sorry. we will pay them for the work that they did. Sorry. We are not a government of victimization. Oh, no. And so, Madam Speaker, in looking at the situation that we have there, it cannot be fair. It cannot be right that a gentleman who has his family, who has his needs to meet, and I hear them say, they're on television, hey, Samuna Laja, yo, hot papi, yo, le hotila. All the people that was owed, all the people who had done work, there were people who had been given the silting contract. They were written to, and they were told, whatever you have, been, you have done, you will not be paid for. And we are asking you to cease all works with immediate effect. Sign contracts, have a contract for a drain that was done behind the backs of school. Everything was done, signed by the engineer. They went to the minister, the member for Castries, then minister of infrastructure, refused to pay. Another gentleman brought his pile of documents. They told him they lost the documents. That is what happened, but we are not like that. And ma Madam Speaker, I'm a man of my words. I'm a man of my words. So I see the member for Denry North. I know he wants to deal with me, but he's not here. But I want to tell him, he said he supported activities in my constituency, and that was true. The only difference is I didn't know it was a minister's account. I thought it was the national lotteries that was supporting, because that's why the national lotteries was established. But Madam Speaker, he gave about $5,000 worth of project. If he's ready, Next week, he can come to the office. I'm going to give him a project that is worth four times the amount. 
that they did for me. Four times. He can come as soon as he's ready. With a project for his constituency. So he gave me 5,000. I'm giving him a project for 20,000. Now, Madam Speaker, how did we get here? The lands down there. You know what ended up happening to us, Madam Speaker? We ended up in a situation where they didn't pay the contractor. We were taken to court. In fact, they went and they established a company with a group of investors from the United Kingdom, and they formed a company named Bo Panel, NHC Bo. 51% shares of that company is owned by the foreign company without an alien land holding license. And the member for Beaufort South would know that for you to be the majority shareholder in a foreign company in St. Lucia to own property, you must get an alien land holding license. They have no alien land holding license. They were supposed to deposit a couple million dollars in an escrow account. No money was deposited there. But yet still they own 51% of the 58 acres of land in River Dole, in Balam Beach. You want to talk about land, and you want to talk about what happened? Madam Speaker, you think that's all? Well, Madam Speaker, the developer, the contractor who was doing the work, they refused to pay him. He took them to court. The land was valued at $2 million, Madam Speaker. Today, we have a judgment in court to pay $7 million and the interest is accumulating. So take it for $2 million. See what they just pay a contractor for to file it. And then we have to pay the $7 million, but we are only a 49% shareholder and the foreign company is the 51% the shareholder. And you want to talk about Ojo Labs that's going to create jobs for the people of St. Lucia. But I excuse you, you wasn't there, you don't know a lot of things, so you need to keep quiet sometimes. <laughs> Papa love about South Africa. <laughs> Madam Speaker, <laughs> Madam Speaker, on the issue of the Moshi housing development, Madam Speaker, on the Moshi housing development, and I spoke about that, Madam Speaker, they went and they built some houses there, Madam Speaker. We are trying to sell the houses below the cost. The house is not selling. Somebody went to the bank. The bank sent to do a structural assessment of the house. The structural assessment by a qualified engineer says that's a bank engineer, not a ministry engineer, because we have live and say, Kaila, the ministry wants to sell the houses. What happened? The houses are not, that particular house is not structurally sound. But they accepted the houses without doing the necessary checks before to hold the contractor liable so the defects liability period has run out. So if we want to sell the houses, we have to go and fix it. And Madam Speaker, Kaila, vid kon kaida se. Ipan kwa azno? Ipan chuizin, ipan petiwe, ipan tiles. In the yoti toilet, a dirty croissant bordage toilet. That's all. And some of the houses, 300 square feet. And you know how much it costs per square feet, Madam Speaker? Over 300 EC dollars to build these houses. Sa croissant. That is what the Labour Party presided over. That was what we were getting for governance in this country. And I see these men stand on the other side there in this house and want to lecture. If I do that, Madam Speaker, while I'm in government, I report in myself at Bordile. I report If I do that, with the money of the people of this country, I deserve to report myself to bodily, Madam Speaker. Because a project like that cannot happen under my watch. 
and Madam Speaker, if you want to see project implementation, tell them come to Forest Hill. We have almost completed the housing development, and government has not had to put one sin. Wow. These are men who can make things happen. That's a government who knows how to take a little and make much out of it. That's the difference. Because we know the value of money. We know the value. So, Madam Speaker, the member for Viewfort South conducted an inquiry on town and village councils because he said we were receiving Taiwanese money that we couldn't account for. By the member for Denry North owns our own admission. What did he say, Madam Speaker? When projects were happening in other places, he didn't see projects happening in Denry North. You know why projects were not happening? Because the Taiwanese was monitoring what was happening. They gave projects, they would give an advance or a down payment, and they come and assess the projects. They never gave parliamentarians money. No parliamentarian on this side of the house ever got money from the Taiwanese. We got projects. As a result, Madam Speaker, when they went to Denry North at the time, they were not satisfied with the projects that they saw, so they stopped the funding. If they continued the funding in all the other constituencies, it means that they were satisfied that there were sufficient projects and they were satisfied that there was value for money. Now they tell you about the David England law has been repealed, but they know they're misleading the country because there's no David England law. Ask them how they, how they got Ogilvy out of St. Lucia. Ask the Labour Party, what law did they use to get Ogilvy out? And Murphy. What law was used to get them out of St. Lucia? But you see, Madam Speaker, they come to this house because you can't pas a change ça you have Because you have to you can't change it. So, Madam Speaker, look at what happened there now. I said to them when I was in government, come and assess the projects in my constituency. Assess it, and if I cannot show that projects was done to the value of the projects that the Taiwan is funded, I will pay the difference. If there is more value than the projects that the Taiwan is funded, then they will pay me the difference. They never took on the challenge. But to let you know, do, oh, you're a ball. That's all they can see. But Madam Speaker, I want them to carry out a commission of inquiry on me. And I know what they're inquiring. I know who's investigating. But I'm waiting for the investigations to come out. Because when it comes out, it will set the record straight. But Madam Speaker, so we didn't get any projects from the Taiwanese for the first year. We got within the second year. So it would mean that each parliamentarian got projects to the tune of about $4 million within their constituencies. Madam Speaker, based on the minister's account and what I presented previously, if you check $200,000 a month for 12 months in a year, that is 24, that's $2.4 million a year. For four and a half years, $11 million. One man. Can't blush. Decide what you want. You decide it. And Madam Speaker, I saw project after project. So I thought all these projects were done by the national lotteries. But I'm being told that these projects were just projects from the minister's account. Now, there was a gentleman here who left. But, Madam Speaker, my opponent in the last election was campaigning in the constituency. 
They build some bleachers by the multipurpose court in Tiroche, and he's telling the people, that is what I have done for y'all. He built it. Only to find out, when I look at the minister's account, I see the benches at the Tiroche multipurpose court, $67,000 from the minister's account. Now, Madam Speaker, they will come. They had four years to investigate me. I just start investigating them. More men the alarm. Eklana law now. That lay investigation na fini. Everybody will be held accountable. Madam Speaker, Marigo playing field under the UWP administration with Minister Montut as the Minister for Youth and Sports. The entire surface of the Marigo playing field was done. Yet still, I see an amount of four hundred and twenty thousand nine hundred and eighty dollars paid for the Marigo playing field. <laughs> Minister's account. Resurfacing of the Mon playing field. Three hundred. Three hundred and eighty-five thousand eight hundred and fifteen dollars. One done on the 15th of, both in fact, one done on the 14th of September and one done on the 15th of September. Two fields. Same contractor. Now, I have deliberately refrained from mentioning names, but I'm waiting for them. I want them to mention a name that pertains to me, Madam Speaker. And when I come back to this house afterwards, I will deal with names. Madam Speaker, now there's a very interesting one, and I'm sure the member from, Castle, from Viewfort South can help me. I don't know if that's Larry Schuss in Viewfort or if it's Larry Schuss in Denry. So maybe somebody will tell me. Carpentry and joinery and floor and wall ceiling finishes Larry Schuss playing field. Now, hear that description, Madam Speaker. Carpentry and joinery, floor and wall, ceiling and finishes, Larry Shoes playing field, 236,300. Madam Speaker, standing order 34. Can I just get a copy of the document that has been referred to? Again, is is uh, and, and not saying anything otherwise. Can you just share the document so I can see? It. And this is a minister quoting from an official government document. And therefore, Madam Speaker, as you indicated in the notes you circulated with us yesterday, the minister is required to make it a document for the House. Madam Speaker, I'm just giving information that I have received. I'm giving information that I have received. And, and these are my notes. These are the information that I have. It is your opportunity at the appropriate time to go and verify with the minister as to whether he paid these monies from the minister's account. He's on your side. Don't pretend that you don't know. I'm just saying the information that I have, Madam Speaker. These are my notes. These are my notes, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, I will mention one name from my notes. My light is on. There is a point of order, and I'm going to rule on it. The honorable member and minister has indicated that he is reading from, he's making reference to his notes as to whether he compiled, where he got or compiled his information from. He says that this forms part of his notes in his presentation. Madam Speaker, with all due respect, I'm actually quoting from a document you said circulated yesterday to guide us. And it's very clear. The minister cannot say that he is quoting from his no. notes when he's referring to official statistics and official records of public affairs. And he said, yes, Madam Speaker, he said he was quoting from a document. The notes you give us is very clear. Very, very clear, Madam Speaker. Do you wish me to read it, Madam Speaker, the guidance notes you gave us yesterday? The, the honorable member must make a copy so we can follow what he is what he's saying, Madam Speaker. 
So, Honorable Member, was a reference made earlier on to what document you are quoting from? No, Madam Speaker, I never made reference to any document that I'm quoting from. I said my information from the relation to the minister's account. Yeah. And, and you know, Madam Speaker, what is interesting is they were on the same side. They are on the same side of the house. They belong to the same team. They should be giving me the information, not me giving it to them. They were the ones in government. So, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, at the end of the day, when, when you get... So, just now, members of the House will have to make all their notes, documents of the House. If that's what it is, then it means that all my speech I have there, I have to come and give it to you. Because, you know, Madam Speaker... Let me put that to rest, please. I have asked the member, he's saying he's making reference to his notes, yes. and in his notes he has figures, which he prepared in the preparation of his notes, he's making reference to figures he has from his notes, quoting from um, information that he has of payments made from the minister's account. Now he is saying that is part of his notes. Madam Speaker. The Honorable Member said he was quoting from a document. Okay, Madam Speaker, how then do we can determine the authenticity? The authenticity of the figures that is quoted, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker. This is, Madam Speaker, all the levity aside, all the joke aside, this is a serious matter. The, the Honorable Member is suggesting that a member who is not present in the House and is not able to stand and speak on his behalf um, authorize certain expenditure and Madam Speaker all I'm asking honorable member if you are saying that an honorable member who is not in the chamber did a particular action I'm asking you can you share the document with me so at least I can read what you're saying and Madam Speaker if it's his notes and he does not wish to make copies of his notes Madam Speaker and you so rule Madam Speaker let's proceed but Madam Speaker you know it is grossly unfair what you've just allowed thank you very much Madam Speaker I have allowed I have allowed the member Now, that is the point. If members are quoting figures, one cannot expect a member, any member on either side of the house to have the document from which they attend figures, from which their notes form part of. And in respect of the honorable member of the house who's not present, let us be mindful of the fact that the honorable member has not presented and he has adequate time to respond to the Honorable Member as well. Proceed, Honorable Member. You owe me five minutes. You owe me ten minutes, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, you know, in, in looking at all of these things, and Madam Speaker, there's no need to be sensitive for people to be sensitive about it, you know, because it's going to be dealt with in other forums. So numbers will be dealt with. The information that I have received, I am using. I heard the member this morning, Madam Speaker, talk about corridor conversation with Don Lockerbie or whoever, the, the name of the person. from. No, I didn't ask him, where's the recording of the statement? Now you want to tell me where I get my information. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for, for ruling on this. Madam Speaker, I went down by the Marigo playing field. And I know the member, I know the member for Castro South is familiar with the changing room facility that was built by the Marigo playing field. I send them to measure it for me, Madam Speaker. It's about 21 feet by 41 feet. It's 21 feet wide by 41 feet. It has two doors on the 25th side, and it has another two doors on the 45th side. I didn't see, I couldn't get inside because I didn't have access. But Madam Speaker, based on my notes, I am seeing the changing room facility 
was built at a cost of 462,000 Four hundred and seventy-seven dollars. Hmm. I can't check that by the square foot. That, that's almost a thousand dollars a square foot. Madam Speaker, a changing room is very ugly. Uh, and you would agree with me, member for Castro South. It has no character. Nothing. I mean, the, the thing does not have a roof, Madam Speaker. It's just a casting they put. A breath you offer. And you just cook a cattle a pot and breath, and breath concrete. You know, 462000 But, Madam Speaker, if that's what the cost was. Madam Speaker, then I saw Eda Inc. Eda Inc., I understood his own is a company jointly owned by my former, my, well, my opponent in the last election, who's a member of this house. So he's free to defend himself. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I see Eda in being paid $155,000 for the same facilities. So now I see one Alexander Paul being paid 400 plus thousand dollars for the same project. Then I see Eda Inc. being paid Marigo playing field changing room facility. You know there's a variance for Alexander Paul again of 15,600. So after I get about almost 500,000, that's still the cost of a run. May you create variance. In this case, variance of fifteen thousand dollars, and then Eda in gets paid another hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars for the same facility. Now, Madam Speaker, somebody must pay for that. Somebody must be held accountable, and UWP should not be in office if nobody is held accountable for managing the affairs of this country in such a bad manner. Now, Madam Speaker, I saw checks, checks, checks. You're talking about hundreds and hundreds of checks written to people. All that from the minister's account. Now, I want to ask the member for you fought South. When he speaks, I want him to address that and to tell the people of St. Lucia why he would take the honorable member for Babono and Sufre to court. Why he would carry out investigations from funds that the Taiwanese was satisfied, was well spent. And under his watch, under his watch, $12 million in one minister's account. In the government, a permanent secretary who is the chief accounting officer cannot execute a project of more than $50,000. You're telling me one minister without the board, without anybody, can just give an order to pay $456,000 for a changing room facility? Can pay... My opponent, $155,000 for the same thing. So if you add that, that is over $600,000. Madam Speaker, this is wickedness to the highest degree. I saw another one. Supervising professional services, adding $80,000. Madam Speaker, these were the monies used against me in the last election. And that is why I believe the member for Viewfort South knew everything that was going on. Because what did he say? I will do any and everything to make sure 
Guy Joseph is not in the parliament of St. Lucia. But you're not God. Only God decides who should be here and who should not be here. And so, Madam Speaker, money. Oh, if you see how many sets of uniforms for Sarot youth, all of these things was done unknown to the minister. Blow the trumpet and the money comes. But he got the worst beating of his life. And there are more links to come. You see, Madam Speaker, the people know. The people know. And a government cannot be comfortable to have done these things and to feel that it is okay. You know, if it's not good for the geese, it's not good for the gander. Madam Speaker, when I look at this thing, I see an Alexander Paul, and I've, that's the only name I've mentioned, and Ada Inc, because Ada Inc is here. Yeah. Ada Inc is in the house. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, when you look at the number of projects I saw from the minister's account, I have to ask myself, because I try to find out who is that major contractor from the minister's account just around the last year before election would have received projects in excess of a million dollars. And I cannot find that person yet. I cannot find that person yet. I'm not saying the person does not exist. But the person will have to answer questions in due course. Because there must be an NIS number that can track back to the persons. Because, Madam Speaker, it cannot be right. And then the minister, the then minister of finance pretends as if he didn't know nothing that was happening. He didn't know you hear playing field, have flooring, have ceiling. Have walls, played field sasa, kind of them speaker. Two hundred and sixty three thousand dollars paid for that. That's a dome. You're right. Madam Speaker, there's so much, Madam Speaker, that you know I have not touched the tip of the iceberg. Honorable member, you have fifteen more minutes within which to I will round off, Madam Speaker. I will round off. Madam Speaker, the wastage that we saw from the last government is unprecedented. So you think 17,000 tickets for jazz before elections? Because that's what they were doing. They were doing everything to buy votes, Madam Speaker. Everything. And when they thought they had it on lockdown, they call a snap election. Yeah, they call, they call a snap, but they got a good slap. <laughs> they got a good slap. So now they name themselves slaps. That's why they name themselves slaps, because it's the slap that they took in this last election. Because you see, you cannot take advantage of the people of St. Lucia and think you can get away with it. You cannot. And Madam Speaker, I hold the people that I represent in high regard. And I don't take their vote for granted. I don't, Madam Speaker. I was made to suffer as the parliamentary representative for the last four and a half years of the Labour Party. And they know that. I consulted the Prime Minister here several times about little projects in my constituency. And he would tell me, go, go to um, Fede. Not this Fede, you know, the other one. Go to him. And you stand in the corridor. You stand in the corridor for hours waiting. That is how we were treated as ministers. But you know, Madam Speaker, I took the humiliation. You know why I took it? Because it was not for myself, but it was for the people that I represented in Castro Southeast. And they put you to sit in the corridor. And you see people walking up and down and going in and going out. They did the same thing. No, no, not your time. This prime minister, this, this opposition lead, um, leader was the, the prime minister. Madam Speaker, this is how we were treated. I didn't grumble. I didn't cry. I didn't shout victimization. I understand politics. 
I understood the politics. And that's why I treated my colleagues in parliament with a certain measure of fairness. But I know the member for Beaufort South. Every time I allocated money for him to do things in his constituency, he never accepted it. And the record is there in the Ministry of Infrastructure, then Communications and Work. Every time, we, if we were given $60,000 for projects, they would be allocated. I went and I did tours with all members. We tried to schedule with him how many times? He's too big to walk around with a little man like me. He was too big for that. But you see, I'm not too big to represent my people. And I'm not too small. I will do what I have to do to represent the interest of the people who elected me to serve them. And when I can no longer look after the best interest of the people of Castro Southeast, then it's time for me to make my exit from the political arena. But I will not get arrogant in representing the people, Madam Speaker. And so I beg, I ask, I went about how many times when we met here, I would tell him, sir, just that we need you know. Tell me right. You write the letters. Yes. 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 I always respect you as Dr. Kenny Anthony and Prime Minister. I always respect. I may not like what you do, but I respect the position. I respect the office of the Prime Minister. Unlike some people who refuse to call the then Prime Minister Prime Minister. Uh, but today you want to pretend that he's better than sliced bread. But he has always been better than sliced bread. Not just today. Not just today. He has always been. He's the same person that he has always been. You see, you see because, because in the political arena, we make the decisions that we have to make as a party. We will see where the cutthroat come in. You ready to lead again? I heard that. We'll find out what happened to the leader of the opposition soon. We will find out where the cutthroat come in. Don't worry about the cutthroat on this side. We can manage our affairs because we are a team. There's no master. There's a captain and players. But all of us play on the same field. All of us. So, Madam Speaker, in moving on, St. Lucia is where it is today. And St. Lucia needs a strong and resolute government to rescue it. Madam Speaker, many people, many people are trying to frustrate the work of the government. Now, Madam Speaker, I do not victimize people. But I will not allow people to victimize the people who have elected us in St. Lucia to carry out a mandate for them. And for those who want to frustrate the work program of government, I'm putting them on notice. You are paid by the state to carry out a job, carry it out well. And if you know about me, you would know that some of the people who are your strongest allies, I worked with them for five years as minister. And I never shifted them around. I never requested transfers for them. That's my track record. Wasco was under my watch for five years. I did not send one person to get a job at Wasco. Slaspa was under my watch for five years. I did not send one person to Slaspa to get a job. I didn't try to fire anybody who was there. But I'm telling you, this time around in government, this time around in government, everybody who's paid by the public must carry out the functions on behalf of the public. I don't want nobody to do nothing for me. I can do things for myself. But when they delay the payments, I gave instructions when we got the money to pay the people well before Christmas. They found every avenue to slow down the payments to say, Minister Pape, say Munna. That is what happens. When we, and you've been there in government, it has happened to you too. So don't pretend that you don't know. There are people who are deliberately frustrating. Now he started telling you about Siberia. 
But Siberia was created to get rid of a lot of people who have not given the government problems, but you did not trust them. You did not want them to know what was happening. We have not created no Siberia. Madam Speaker, we are in a situation where we are being told about I make requests for some people to be in certain positions. Public servants, they say, oh, this person cannot move from grade 10 to grade 14. They skip in four grades. But people came from 0 to 21. They came from no grade to grade 21. The same public service approve it. The same public service commission who cannot promote somebody from grade 10 to grade 14, career public servants, who have given years and years of service to this country and have not been given the opportunity for upward mobility. But you see some people, they've never been in the public service. They don't have no grade. Their grade is zero. So public service can move, public service commission can move from grade zero to grade 21, but you cannot move from grade 10 to grade 14. And I'm supposed to sit there, elected by the people to carry out their mandate and smile as if everything is okay. There are people who want to frustrate the plans of this government of turning around the economy. And I'm saying to them, work for the money that you earn. You carry out your job, nobody will interfere with you. They have some, they don't even greet you when they see you. They're so vexed. No respect. You greet them and they answer you as if you're not existing. Now we are bigger than that. I've worked in all kinds of environment. I'm from a private sector background, so I can deal with that. I dealt with the minibus sector for many years. So there's nothing anybody can do to me that can get to me. I'm seasoned. But I want, I want persons to understand that you are not punishing the 17 politicians who sit around this table. You are punishing the hardworking taxpayers of this country who pay for you to have a job. And so when a person comes to deliver a letter and a receptionist looks at the person and thinks because they have a yellow bungle in their hand, they tell them, I am at lunch, you have to go and come back. You tell me I'm supposed to tolerate that as a minister? That an elderly person comes to the ministry for basic service? And because you realize their political affiliation, they're from the same community with you, you're going to exercise your authority by telling the person, the person you want to see is not there, you have to come back when the person is in the office. Honorable member, you have five more minutes within which to complete your presentation. I will, Madam Speaker. Thank you. So, Madam Speaker, I am saying that there are problems, and that is why we are saying we need to fix things. I am appealing to everyone, Madam Speaker, the public servants, the private citizens, the members of the opposition. Every time you're all in opposition, you're all saying, let's work together. Mm -hmm. Now I'm putting it to you all. When we were there, you all said, let's work together. I'm putting it to you. Let's work for the betterment of St. Lucia. Let's work for the betterment of St. Lucia. And if you are interested in the development of St. Lucia, let us put our heads together and work. Madam Speaker, on the DSH project, I will close on this matter. Madam Speaker, I will release documents in due course, Madam Speaker, but I want them to know, I want them to know that everything they started negotiating, they claiming, I heard them, they claim this, they claim that. So you all didn't start negotiations with DSH? You all claiming all the hotels? You all didn't start negotiations with DSH? So you're making a big fuss about 900 acres, but you want me to believe a man building one factory and he need a thousand acres of land for one factory? It's a factory, sir, a solar factory. A solar farm will not take a thousand acres. 
You know, you offer a man a thousand acres and he tell you he building a factory that will cost 800 million pounds. You know, Madam Speaker, people must be honest. I know I belong to a government, Madam Speaker, who is determined to fix this economy and the policies articulated by the Prime Minister in his budget address is just the first step in moving in the direction of putting this country back on the right course. Now you can cry over spilled milk if you want. You've had 15 years as Prime Minister. You couldn't do it. If you don't make hay while the sun shines, it's in the rain you want to make hay. It's not going to happen. It cannot happen. You've had your chance and you have failed. I don't know how to say it again. The people of this country have invested 15 years with you as Prime Minister. And you didn't get it. You think is now you get in it? You think is now you, you can't get it. So, Madam Speaker, I want these people on this side of the house. And you'll always be second in command. <laughs> and very soon you will not be sitting where you're sitting there. You heard the program on NBC? You're having two. Padu, Padu Kavin Pu, your own, your own team coming for you. So I want you all to understand, this is a united team. We are working together for the advancement of this country. And Madam Speaker, I have every confidence that by the next three years, we would see such a dramatic change in the fortunes of this country that the Labour Party will retire from politics and say to the right people, continue to run the affairs of this country. I thank you.